uh, guys, this is Adam Baragzai over at AHS Realty Pros. And last week we had Ann Catherine come down here and uh, school us on some contract work. And uh, it was such a great experience. Me, Kenny, everybody wanted to thank Ann Catherine. So, Ann Catherine, if you're watching this video, you're awesome and thank you. And Kenny's here. We were speechless by the time you left. Hey, Ann. It was an honor and a pleasure to have you come into the office and give a little training on contracts. I think everybody learned. Even I learned something. So, Ann Catherine, thank you again. And uh, Angel wanted to say hi. I can't wait to see you soon. Hey guys, we got Ann Catherine here, and she's going to tell us what she's going to do today. All right. Well, so I just asked them if Kenny had said anything about me, and they said that they were all super afraid. And I determined <laughs> that that's why nobody sent me an offer to review because I'd scared them. And then they said that they, now that they met me, they're not intimidated. And then I was like, well, wait until I finish. But anyway, <laughs> so I'm really honored and privileged to be here. I think it's it shows, it, it's a testament to Kenny and Adam that they're willing to bring in an outside broker. That's, you know, I'm gonna influence you guys in terms of how you do business. Um, but I think I have the credentials um, to stand here. Um, it's not something, well, first of all, I'm, a, I'm actually have been a paid subject matter expert for the state of California. So I've consulted on the broker exam. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been a broker for eight years myself. Um, I'm an independent broker. I don't have any agents under me. Um, I'm a selling broker and I'm out in the world transacting and it's actually really funny because Kenny and Adam and I met at, a, at a, an event, a real estate event, and we got to talking and then soon thereafter I went and contracted with one of your colleagues. And um, so it was just really kind of Funny on that. Kind of destined, I guess. Yes. <laughs> so um, I also just um, passed my broker exam, renewed it. So it's a uh, renews for every four years. And to put in perspective how I feel about this, I that exam takes about six hundred questions. Now remember, I consulted on how that exam is drafted, what questions need to be asked, <laughs> all of that, so that somebody walking out with the broker exam with broker license is prepared to do this job which we find so important you're, you're dealing yeah. with people's most valuable asset in almost all cases mm -hmm. um, so it's important to get it right right does so let me ask you something does the DRE when a licensee makes a mistake do they consider the percentage that they got right what do you think on the test or on a contract? No, no. Uh, if, if once you're licensed, you go transacting out in the world and the DRE is going to take you to task on something, do they consider how much you got right? No. 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 They don't care. No. So if you get one thing wrong, could it impact your license? Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Right? Yes. One, one mistake, right? Yes. So to put it in perspective, when I took, so here I am, the person that I am, I've been a broker for eight years, I've been licensed for 16. I was the head developer rep for Worldmark Resorts when I started. I, I saw oversaw every contract for uh, the San Francisco office, and then I went residential. Um, when I took that exam now for the third time, and oh, six hundred questions for the continuing education, all the all the test questions, I on no test did I miss more than one question. Oh. Most questions. Most tests, I got 100%. Mm -hmm. For the test, but obviously if I only miss one, I pass the test. Mm -hmm. and they renewed my license, okay? Mm -hmm. For all the questions I got wrong, which was maybe 12 to 18 questions mm -hmm. throughout the 600, uh -huh. I took each one of those tests over until I got it 100% right. Mm -hmm. Because my clients, are they are not interested in me getting one thing wrong. Yeah. If it's their transaction, they're right. not, well, gosh, you do it mostly right. Mm -hmm. it's, so It's like that uh, Geico commercial that says he's okay. Right. Some of the times, you know, if you have an okay surgeon. Yeah. You know, oh, you no. Right. Re yeah. You ever see that? Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. You do not want to be an okay agent. And, yeah. and you know, it causes some yeah. friction for me in, mm -hmm. in the marketplace. So here, here's a here's another question. 
and so I say this sometimes when I go into contract, I say, hey, by the way, you know, you're working with a broker and I cannot unbroker myself. I can't mm -hmm. not know what I know. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just, it's not going to happen. So the one thing I want you guys to look at is I want you to look at page one of uh, disc uh, agency disclosure. Oh, did he cast them out? They, they have one and I think they have one. Here's, here's one to look at. Okay. So who can tell me what what really does agent what is agency disclosure? What's the importance of it? What's its purpose? Uh, Go ahead. You're um, the new, newly minted licensee, uh, right? Yeah. Um, I, isn't it to to know what kind of contract you're gonna do with your client, like whether it's gonna be a, like a internet leasing or, or something different, like a, like a, I forgot the name of the contract. Um, um, basically, yeah, you know, your relationship right. between your your client and yourself. Is, is what okay, is so right, ready to pass those out. So that anybody else. Do you need this? Do you need your copy? I have mine. Okay. Here, okay. Who else wants to add to that? Um, I think we it's it's uh, the yeah. agency contract. Or the agency. I I just want to talk about agency disclosure. Those two pages. Two pages. Um, it's the disclosure between the agency, the broker brokerage uh, contract, exclusive signage. The client. It's, it's uh, you're basically telling you that there could be more than one way that you'll be making an offer. The whole book you could be making an offer on the, you know, or you could be doing two transactions. You're now working slowly on that transaction. You could be um, working on other with other clients and. Okay, Barry. It just we basically tell each other that we are representing them. So. In other words, we are taking on responsibility because, you know, by law, they don't know the contract concept. So we are the one that, that's why we held on obligated because we're supposed to know how to protect them. Okay. And then explain the, you know, type okay. of agency. So who can tell me what obligations you have? If, if you were to represent a seller, what are your obligations? Well, we have to protect them, first of all, them and ourselves from lawsuit. So whatever Liability. Is, so yes. your number one goal is to, exactly. is, to is, is risk management. Yeah. Okay. So what else? We need, and also the best interest of all the facts to know that they keep Who do you keeping. have to have the best interest of? The best interest of the... Our client, either buyer or seller. Okay, whoever your client is. Right. Okay. Right. What other What other um, things can you tell me about the duties of an agent as as gone through on this? We have to be mm -hmm. honest with everyone. You owe honesty. a duty of honesty. Right. Right. Who do you have to be honest with? We want to all the parties. All the parties. All the okay. Reasons. Good. 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 Mary? Yeah. yeah. I know you wanted to, you wanted to help them out, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, okay. Okay, so, so any point. anything else? Any subjects? Anything else that you want to say about those duties? Fiduciary. Fiduciary duty. Fiduciary is the one about protecting, you know, the interests of your client. Mm -hmm. What does fiduciary mean? Fiduciary, but we only have that if we are single agent. Um, if you are transaction agent, we don't have. Fiduciary. Well, you're speaking from a point of view as a, as somebody from Florida, and that is the biggest difference between Florida and California. But here also, we very have rare, very rarely are you a transaction agent. So that that is the number one distinction between Florida and California. So, um, but I'm I'm glad you you raise it. Okay, so can anybody else give me a definition of fiduciary? I'm sorry. Anybody else give me a definition of fiduciary? Fuck. Loyalty. Honesty, loyalty. Uh, anything that's impacts. Did you say lawyer or loyalty? Loyalty. Okay. All right. Loyalty, anything honesty. that impacts the value of their house, you have to. That's not part of the fiduciary. That's part of disclosure. disclosure. But that is a duty that's outlined here. <coughs> so basically, fiduciary means we have to put their interest before our interest. Very well said. Yes. Okay. 
besides real estate agents, can anybody name um, who else, what other professions have fiduciary? Lawyer. A lawyer? Doctors. Mm -hmm. Doctors. Doctors. Nurses. Teachers. Anybody in the medical field? Medical field, yeah. Clergy? Clergy. Clergy. Okay. <coughs> so here's what I'm going to say about this. Um, if you cannot get agency disclosure right, and when I come back to what I said when I started this, I mean 100% right. Mm -hmm. You are in harm's way as a brokerage, as a licensee, your clients are in harm's way. It is the most important document in real estate. Do you realize that if you get agency disclosure wrong, they can unwind a transaction? A closed transaction. That's how critical it is. If you ended up in litigation and agency disclosure was, was improperly executed, you will immediately put yourself as not having the skill level to have done your job. So if, if, if I am in a courtroom, right, and I've got a, a legal battle, and I'm not an attorney, so I'm not trying to give legal advice, but this comes from my, Shannon Shannon Jones, who does a lot of legislative updates, is actually uh, an attorney uh, through my uh, work with uh, e &O Insurance. So I listen to Shannon. She's one of the best in the business. Uh, be very afraid if you ever had to go up against Shannon, okay? Um, that being said, well, I wouldn't say that because it really still matters who's right and who's wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, Shannon has said repeatedly that if, if she's representing somebody and the other agency doesn't have agency disclosure right, all she has to do is put that in front of the judge and everything that comes after that is questionable. Because the point is, is if you can't get agency disclosure right, how are you supposed to get all the other documents right? Right? So none of you are attorneys. These documents have been prepared by attorneys, California Association of Realtors, okay? And they, I, it's my personal opinion that our um, car is one of the best in, in the United States, probably in the world. And their documents, which is a living and breathing document, that's the reason why there's a date at the bottom of every single one of these forms, so you know when you have the most up-to-date okay. form. Every time they're updated, it's because somebody got into a lawsuit, and they went, well, you know what, we probably need to clarify that a little bit more. This is a changing field, and we need to change this, that, or the other thing. The other thing that I think makes agency disclosure so unique is page two. What's page two? Civil codes. It's the civil code. So they think that agency disclosure is so important that they attach the civil code right behind it, right? So when you violate one of these principles, are you in trouble with the DRE, just the DRE? No, you're in trouble with the California legislature, right? So here, here's a question. So I wanna make sure we understand that there are four duties that are outlined here, four. The first one is fiduciary. I have a fiduciary duty of the utmost care, honesty, and loyalty in dealing with my client, right? It says right here. It says fiduciary duty of the utmost care, integrity, honesty, and loyalty in dealing with the client, whoever the principal is for you, okay? The second duty is a duty of honest and fair dealings and good faith. You have to operate in good faith. You owe that duty to all parties, yes. not just your client. The third duty is a duty to disclose all facts known. Um, I'm sorry, the first one was the, of the duties is after fiduciary. It's diligent exercise of reasonable skill and care and in performance of your agent's duties. You have to know what you're doing. You owe that duty to all parties. So when I go into contract with you, you owe that duty to me, okay? So, the, and the, the third duty is a duty to disclose all facts known to the agent that material affect the value or desirability of the property that are not known to or within the diligent attention and observation of the parties. Um, you're not obligated to disclose something confidential. Okay. Um, and you're not, you're not obligated to go above and beyond. Okay. So it's whatever your affirmative actions are. So that means that I don't have to go climb the roof. 
Mm -hmm. I don't have to crawl the crawl space. I don't have to go and check public record. All of that is, by the way, detailed out in your agent visual inspection disclosure, what your duties are. Mm -hmm. um, so here's a question to you. Of these four, fiduciary, reasonable skill, honesty, disclosure, which do you think is the most important? Disclosure. Disclosure, fiduciary, fiduciary? Yeah. Disclosure. Disclosure. Fiduciary. <laughs> I think you went with disclosure because the two brokers said disclosure. <laughs> so I, I'm going to say, I'm going to disagree with you all. No. Um, okay. okay. I'm going to tell you that the one I think is the most important Honestly. is reasonable skill in the performance of your oh. duties. Here's why I think that's your number one. Because if you have reasonable skill in the performance of your duties, are you going to be dishonest? If you have reasonable skill in the performance of your duties, are you going to make sure that the disclosures are right? Mm -hmm. it, it's giving me chills to talk about this sometimes. But anyway, <laughs> um, that's, that's good. That's how passionately that's, I feel yeah, about it. True. But do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because no. let's just say this. Let's just say that you're a super honest person, right? Mm -hmm. You would never tell a lie. And you would never let something like that go. You would never put your interests ahead of a client. If you have reasonable skill, are you still in harm's way? Yeah. Because if you don't you know, know. Yeah. and you screw up, where does that put you? Yeah. Where does that put your client? So reasonable skill, well, first of all, just so you know, the DRE doesn't care which one you violate. They will treat them all the same. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. But I'm just saying, that's the reason why I, I, I said, let, let me come and help raise the professionalism in the industry to the highest level. Because, I, I, and I'm not trying to brag, but I, it sounds like I am, but this is also about making money, right? You're here to make money. Do you think you will make more money if you are better at your job? Yes. Okay. Do you think your transactions might be a little smoother? Yes. If you're better at your job? Sometimes they are and sometimes they're not, right? My transactions are not necessarily smooth because I can't unbroker myself and I deal with a lot of people who don't know things. That's what I was gonna say. Right? right? A lot of people and I can't, I can't waive my, my fiduciary. Can I waive my fiduciary? No. Because I need to get along? No. no. I have gone head to head I, I, I'm since I, this is on video, I'm not going to name names. I've gone head to head with one of the biggest brokerages in the area. Head, you know, I've gone knock down, drag out with the city attorney of Richmond. Mm -hmm. I have never not prevailed. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because you don't get to go outside of the four corners of this document. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. And when my file is. Literally, I've had files in front of attorneys and they go out of everybody here, did train wreck, death and destruction as far as the eye can see, right? And they go, out of everybody here, Anne Catherine, you're the only one that's got nothing to worry about. That lets me sleep well at night, yeah. right? So I remember I submitted an offer in, in um, Pittsburgh and uh, there, it was in the height of the REO you know, market and there was 28 offers on the property. I did not write the highest offer, okay? Super excited for my client, it was perfect, right? And I called up the listing agent, heavy hitter, REO agent, and I said, hey, Mark, I said, you know, super excited, fantastic, excited to go in contract. Um, I said, I know you had 28 offers, and I know I didn't write the highest offer, and I said, so how come I got it? He goes, Aunt Catherine, you're the only one that wrote perfect paper. So I have had numerous agents say that to me. So when I'm on the listing side, yeah. what you submit to me, I will judge your competency and whether I want to go into contract with you. And I will provide that information to my client. One of the offers that um, Kenny just showed me was on a outdated RPA. Is that reasonable skill? Mm -hmm. Does the car just update these forms because they want to just keep yeah. themselves busy? They don't, okay? Mm -hmm. So my advice is that you read this document and live it, learn it, okay? The other thing I wanna tell you is you mostly got it wrong. So this is back where she said, I'm gonna be really intimidating. <laughs> 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 and 
and I'm sorry, but I'm here to help no, you yes. never no, get it wrong no. again. No, of course. This document, there's three legs to agency disclosure. And I'm not even going to ask you because I, I already know you guys don't know what those three legs are. So it's disclosure, okay? It's election, confirmation. And there, you really do need to orally say it as well. You can't just do it in paper. So this fourth does not say what the agency relationship is at all. One of the things when we used to do paper by hand, right? We never do that. How often do you sign something by hand anymore? Which is super rare. But I used to always see that they would circle one of these dual agency. By the way, in dual agency, the one change is I can never tell a buyer that a seller's willing to accept less than their list price. The offer. And I'm, I can never tell a seller that a buyer's willing to pay more than the offer price without the written express permission of the client. Okay, that's a big difference. And I can't give full fiduciary to both clients. It does compromise my fiduciary. Here's another trick question. You're representing the buyer. Okay, and you find us the uh, I mean, you're representing the seller, and you find the buyer. Mm -hmm. So two different agents involved. Do we have dual agency? Same represent. Yes. Yeah. No, you're wrong. So that is dual agency because agency rests with the broker. Yes. Not the agent. Right. You are a sub agent of the broker. So if I'm Caldwell Banker, uh -huh. and I have a Caldwell Banker office in Antioch, and I have one in Concord. Oh, they're on the same brokerage. It doesn't matter. If you're the same brokerage, right. whether it's the Antioch office or the Concord office, agency rests with the broker. Oh, yeah. So I, I literally want to like pop veins. I was with, with a, and I'm not saying that, that we have, a, dual agency is legal for proper disclosure. Right. Mm -hmm. There are times when, when there's, that's the way it is. If I bring in the buyer, will my seller accept an inferior offer because I'm representing the buyer? No, mm -hmm. they're there to sell it to, with the best buyer. I need to submit the winning offer. Mm -hmm. If I have the winning offer, I've got the, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't, it, it's not automatic that dual agency is bad. The problem is, is when it's when it's failure to disclose. Yeah. That's the issue. Yeah. Okay. So to me, I, and I sat in this. I used to do with Delta Association of Realtors, and he, another heavy, heavy hitter, hardcore, me, mega broker. And I, we were talking, and Gov Hutchinson Carr was there, and um, and he's talking, and we're talking about dual agency. And I said something about dual agency because I don't have a problem with it. I'm not waiting for you to bring me a buyer. I'm at, uh, my job is to sell that property. I'm actively looking for the seller. You are competing with me. I am I am actively looking for that buyer. So, because I'm not gonna wait for you. I'm not sitting there putting a sign in the ground and just waiting around, right? I have a job to do. I've been hired to get, it, get the job done. So anyway, so I said something about dual agency. This heavy hitter, she's a broker. She goes, oh, she was just mortified. Oh, I would never do dual agency. I automatically refer it to somebody in my office. Mm. And I'm just like, <laughs> holy crap, like uh, forks in my eye, right? Uh, because that's worse. Uh, she yeah. thinks, therefore her public thinks, mm -hmm. that they don't have dual agency, that there's no potential yeah. conflict of interest. Yeah. So it's worse. Yeah. Yeah. You have dual agency and you think you don't. Yeah. So you do, is that reasonable skill? Yeah. Not really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could so, you get into trouble? So oh, of yeah. course, oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is only a disclosure. Yeah. That's why it's called agency disclosure. Mm -hmm. All you're doing, and the most important sentence here, here is right at the top. This form is being provided in connection with a transaction, and it says right here. It says when you enter into what. Discussion. Discussion. Discussion with the real estate agent with the licensee regarding a transaction. Can you be at a cocktail party and do you have to whip one of these out? Yes. No. What? No. no. You don't have to whip one <laughs> out. Of cocktail yeah. party. That was my plan. You no. should, from the outset, understand what type of agency relationship or re representation you, public, wish to have with the agent in the transaction. Can the public decide what? what they want, which duties they want 
if they don't know? Can you make a decision if you don't know? No. no. So you have to inform them. Exactly. Hey, Mr. Seller, just so you know, in real estate, there are three types of agencies. There's agents that represent sellers, there's agents that represent buyers, and there's agents that represent both buyer and seller, also known as dual agency. You're the seller. We're getting ready to sign a listing. So to the seller, I have a fiduciary duty to you of the utmost guilt, honesty, integrity, loyalty to you, right? But I also have three other duties, and I owe those duties to all three parties. You should be able to say this without even looking at the form. That's how well you should know this document. Then you go, now, a buyer, we, don't, we haven't identified the buyer. I may bring in the buyer, and if so, that will create dual agency. If there's dual agency, this is what I can and cannot do. Any questions? No, great, sign here. Just so you know. We've also, we think it's so important we've included the civil code is on page two of this form. Does that feel different to you than your prior understanding of what this form does? Mm -hmm. Yeah? yeah? Does oh, it feel yeah. real different? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. You're not just giving it to them, oh, this is, I just represent you. Now they understand why you're representing them. Oh, I just need you to sign this. Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, this doesn't, this, this is a disclosure, pure and simple. Yeah. Disclosure is unilateral, not bilateral. It's one person to another, okay? I'm gonna tell you another funny story about this. So a lot of people don't know this if you're fairly new to the industry, but it used to be that there were three of these, one from a seller to uh, an a, a agent to the seller, buyer's agent to buyer, and then the buyer's agent had to disclose to the seller prior to contract, prior to presenting the offer. and and. Buyers agents couldn't get this right. It's called, it was called the third leg of agency. Yeah. Okay. So it was just absolutely could not get right. It was forks in your eyes, and and we the people who knew it made us crazy. It was like nails on chalkboard, right? And yeah. I know because I have firsthand interaction with a lot of people at CAR and legal counsel, and I mean it would just they would just like be going, oh, it's like ooh, so crazy. So that's why you, you see that there's three when you look up look up on the form there's different types of agencies there? Right. Yeah. Well, we've since eliminated it because yeah. honestly, the, the the car just finally gave up. They were just like, what they want, they, they, they just were like, we literally, the exact words, we have to idiot proof this, okay? So finally, we could, they couldn't get it right, couldn't get it right, and again, back to it can unwind a transaction. So as a listing agent, I was constantly having to fix buyer's agents, agency disclosure in order to get their offers properly presented. So finally, they, they kind of figured it out. I was there the day that Gov announced it at the Lesher Center. About 5,000 agents in the room. They had just sent out the new um, RPA. They, I mean, you could see he was just like, nah, I got you guys, I got it, right? He was so excited. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you, 5,000 people in the room. And, and he's like, yeah, we finally idiot proofed it. You can't even write a contract without agency disclosure. We attached it to the contract. <laughs> he was like so excited. And I raised my hand and I said, uh, I said, but you put it at the end of the RPA. It has to be <laughs> first. <laughs> so the reason why this document is first, the first is because I corrected the punches. <laughs> oh and I was like, he was on stage and he's like, Oh, he's like, oh my God, Aunt Catherine, you're right. <laughs> and why? Because of that sentence. Does one sentence matter in real estate? Yes, it does. Does mm -hmm. one box matter? Yep. Yes. Okay, that sentence that says, before you enter into a discussion. So the minute it gets real, you you do need to do an agency disclosure. So let me ask you, when's the, when should you get this signed? Are you, this is you're asking your team. Yeah. When you first meet. When you first meet with your clients. How many of you work with my buyer broker agreement? I did on here. Uh, I don't. You know, I'm not going to enforce them because you got to take the buyer to court. Because a lot of times, if what happened, I've done buyer broker agreements and then they go buy with somebody else, like a developer, and then the who am I going to take to court? The buyer. Well, that's a business decision. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Okay, so, yeah. so just so you know, I work exclusively by buyer broker agreement. So my buyer client has signed these when they go into, when I, the, I don't put a key in a door before I have a fully executed right. representation agreement. Because I don't have the time. I'm not there to play the field and see who's, 
committed, mm -hmm. right? But that's a super skill that, you know, most people have to develop and maybe yeah. at one point I could train on that. But I can tell you this, fewer than 5% of licensees work by buyer broker agreement, yet the results of working by buyer broker agreement is 87% of clients will uh, conclude a real estate transaction if they're under buyer broker agreement. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a business decision. Yeah. Um, and I've never had a buyer buy with, without my representation um, once I've had a buyer broker agreement signed. So, but so it should be. But there are times that I will get this one document signed, and this is the only document. Yeah. And I will say, hey, this doesn't commit you to anything, but I just want to make sure that you're aware. Yeah, that's it. Because you can't win a procuring cause claim, meaning get get compensation if you did not have an agency disclosure right. signed. But that doesn't give them obligation to work with other broker. Uh, if a if a principal signs this disclosure, they have created no obligations. No, none you have simply, that's the important point of this whole conversation. It is a disclosure. Yeah. It's not a contract. Yeah. It's not an agreement. It's a disclosure. Yeah. yeah. That's not it. unless you have them sign a DI, you know. But it, it is a disclosure and that's it. But it is the first step that you must take before you can take any further step <coughs> because it says before you enter into a discussion with a licensee you mm -hmm. should know there are multiple relationships it's, right exactly um, real quick I always wondered about this too Linda. when should you check that box which box if checked oh that's a great question Okay, this one, that's, that's a good question, and I'm glad you asked it. So if I sign a lease that's um, one year, um, exceeding one year, a year and a day, then I would check that box, and then I would be landlord-tenant. Right, so that's, this is for our leases, for the lease. mainly, mainly that You part. still, you still have to do it right. for a lease. Just for lease. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's not lease, required if it's a short term, like if I'm doing Airbnb, it's not required. Yeah. But if it's a long-term lease, one year, one year or more, one year uh, exceeding one year or is the definition. Yeah. But okay. So the next document is possible representation of more than one buyer or seller disclosure and consent. Hold, hold on, I'm gonna ask yeah. you a question. So I come in for a listing appointment on here. Like, let's just idiot proof this one, okay? Okay. I come in for a listing appointment, right? <laughs> Before I go into anything else on there, is it a good idea to begin the conversation with this? No. Okay. There for the, okay. No, I, 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 I see your point, and I feel like that's a, that's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and that's a little bit awkward, probably from a technical standpoint. Okay. Yeah, you should be, be, you know, knock on the door, ring. Okay, can you sign the agency disclosure? Let me go over that first. But that's not natural. No. And so, no, I would sit down and do a consultation with my client, and then say, hey, you know, let's go ahead and, you know, just do the paperwork. I'd start with that. Sure. Once they've decided to go into business with me um, and I've gotten that commitment, then I'm ready to do that paperwork. But mm -hmm. but it, no, your question is excellent. And um, uh, I mean, quite sure. frankly, to my joke, which was you need to whip out one of these at a cocktail party. If you start quizzing <laughs> me enough, I just might. <laughs> I might go, you know what? That's an excellent question. But before we go any further, I'm going to have to disclose you. Right? Yeah. Then they're going to be like, what? I'm going to have to Right? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, there is, there's yeah. practical concerns, but really you, you've got, I just, I just want to make sure it's really important. One, what it is, what its purpose is, and when it must be done. And it must be done first. You don't get to move right. to the next square. Okay. So the next document is possible representation of more than one buyer or seller, disclosure and consent. Does everybody have that? Who signs this? And Catherine, can we do, we're gonna take a, one second pause to switch cameras because I don't wanna miss anything here. Is that okay? okay? Yeah, this one's not that important. Though. Here, look, everything's important. Yeah. We're good. Okay. ERBS. So again, is this a disclosure? Is this a contract? What is this? The disclosure. It's a disclosure. 
and it's it's kind of more to a little bit one layer down from agency disclosure, right? So to me, do what question? Do you think I have? How many, who do you think I have signed this? Your client, whoever is buyer. Or but seller. all clients? Do I have to have all clients sign this? No, but the buyers. Mm -hmm. The buyers. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to have everybody sign this. You want to know why? Because I never only work with one person. I am never working with one principal. I am always working with multiple people. Even if I sign a listing, is there the possibility that I may work with a buyer? related to that seller. Yes. Yeah. It, always. Yeah. So everybody signs this. Right. Because mm -hmm. there's it's it says there's the possibility. If I list a property, is the seller down the street maybe interviewing me because they want to list their property? Right. Is it possible I could have two listings on that street? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Possible two sellers. Is it possible I could be working with multiple buyers looking in a similar category? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Is there a possibility of dual agency? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the other thing I really want to talk about is this paragraph right here. Offers are not necessarily confidential. Are, buyer, uh, are offers confidential? Is it your ethical duty as a listing agent to keep the terms of the offers confidential? Is that your ethical duty? Kenny says no. No. It unless, unless the seller. Absolutely not. Okay. I owe no confidentiality of the terms of the offers to anybody, Even quite frankly. If your seller tells you that, you know, don't, don't mention it, yeah. what are the offers. It needs to be in writing. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. So unless the parties have signed a confidentiality agreement, there's no, there's no obligation of confidentiality. I always laugh when I call up a listing agent and I, yeah. and they go, hey, there's six, they go, yeah, there's, I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to submit an offer, there's six offers on this property. And I go, well, what do you got on the table? So uh, I, I tell them, I, well, I, don't, I don't need to practice. I'm in it to win it. You, that's yeah. what I'm saying. They say that, oh, I cannot tell you. Yes, you can. There's no legal obligation. Yes, They're wrong. Could, could I they have no legal or right. ethical. In fact, they could be doing their solar harm. That's right. Well, Here's why, right? I, I have a funny, funny story. I remember I had a listing, the height of the market, the height of the decline of the market, and I had a, a listing. It was like, let's say, short sale was supposed to sell for like 175 and um, I get an offer for one thirty, and and it's got seller to clear section one. I mean, this is like a massive loss for the bank. I'm like, yeah, dude, that's not gonna happen, right? You you want to offer forty five thousand when everybody's taking a hundred thousand haircut, and you think that we're gonna write a blank check because there was no uh, um, pest inspection on file. And uh, we're going to write a blank check for clearing section one. It's just not going to happen. So he writes this 130 offer. He's, so he submits the offer. I counter it, removing this as a, as a condition. And I'm ready to ex have it accepted. i got to get something in front of the bank and at least get the bank out to appraise mm -hmm. this property and start moving this ball forward. I have to have an offer to move the short sell forward. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we go back and forth. And he's just like, you know, and I'm like, dude, I said, you're fighting over, uh, then I'm like, we're going to pay for the pest inspection. Like, spend $150 for the pest inspection. Yeah. Like, we were, at that point, fighting over $150. Mm -hmm. So, he's he's doing that, and we're not mm -hmm. in contract, because we don't, when do we have a contract? Yeah. When is there a contract? When, 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 when there's a meeting of the minds. Yeah. Okay? And there's delivery. <laughs> and delivery. And delivery. That's why it's okay. so important. And delivery. Okay. So, it's so important to sign that confirmation of acceptance. Well, that's a courtesy. It's not but, required. No, but I... Okay. So, it, 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 but I agree. I agree. But it's a courtesy. Yeah, yeah. The minute there's delivery, provided that's everybody nice. hits the deadlines, there's meeting of the minds, that's confirmation. Uh, that, that's ratification. Um, so... In this case, another player entered in this back and forth period. So he goes to write. Uh, uh, he goes. Well, I said, "Well, I got 130 on the table." Well, he comes in. He goes. Well, he goes. I'm going to write 131. I was like, "Oh my God, you're killing me!" I said, "You you want me?" I said. So I said, "It's got to be better than the 130 I got on the table because I I'm not ready to throw this buyer under the bus for for a 
you know, he was first to the table. I said, that's what I got on the table. You know, we know fair market value is, is higher than that. So he calls me back. He goes, I'm going to write 131. I was like, oh, my God, like, you're killing me. He goes, you want it or not? I said, of course I want it. So he sends me the offer for 131. I then multiple counter. Now that counter changes to a seller multiple counter. Mm -hmm. And the first agent comes back and goes, what's this? I said, well, in the amount of time that you've been blank around, um, I talk like a sailor sometimes, but anyway, when the amount of time we've been going back and forth, I said, a new player came along. I said, you're now on multiple. I said, this is on you. You could have ratified this. I wasn't fighting you on price, but here we are. Literally, it went back and forth, and I said, in 45 counters, we'll finally be at the price that the bank's going to accept, right? It was 100. <laughs> I ended up closing it with my own buyer, ultimately, at 175. But she came in in the 130s, too, and it was just a crazy transaction. But my point comes back to um, offers are not kept confidential. Nope. Right? Right. So if you need that offer to be kept confidential, if there's a reason to do it, you submit an agreement for confidentiality prior to submitting the offer. You say to the seller, you say to the listing agent, hey, we're ready to submit an offer, but we're going to want to keep those terms um, confidential. You may want to keep, if I'm representing Brad Pitt, do you think maybe I might want to keep that confidential? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I may just want to protect the identity. Yep of my client, okay? So you have to have that signed in advance. <laughs> and that form's on the car. Okay. So you could ask things about the buyer as well, like? No, you can't ask things about I mean, the buyer. You, you can question, okay, what is the highest price? What is the terms? You could ask about the terms. Yeah. Oh, I was just wondering because. No, you can't disclose confidential information. So for example, if I'm representing the seller, okay? And buyer calls me up, and, they, and this is buyers do this all the time. Buyers call you up, and they say buyers agents. Um, and sometimes I'll say buyer when I'm meeting buyers agent, and I want you to understand why. When I represent somebody, who am I as an agent? Who am I? When I'm an agent, I stand in the shoes of the principal. I am the principal. When you disclose something to me, it's as good as having disclosed it to my client. It's done, right? You've disclosed to me. So when you're an agent and you have agency relationship, you are standing in the shoes of the principal. That doesn't mean that you get to speak for them and do, you, you get to speak for them as they've instructed you, right? But may, you have to kind of understand that. So um, your question, so I get buyer's agents will call me and say, what is, why is the seller selling? That seems like a, an innocuous question, you know, harmless question, right? Seems legitimate, right? Yeah. Why would a buyer a buyer's agent ask that? I get asked that all the time, too. Right? Yeah. How do you answer it? Well, do you answer well, it honestly? It depends on the situation. I think honestly, you most of the time you shouldn't answer it. I should never it's transition. irrelevant yeah. because. If I said to this to that buyer's agent, well, they're getting a divorce, they have to sell. Yeah. Have I just compromised my fiduciary to my yes. client? I have. Yes. I have weakened their negotiation. <coughs> oh my God, that's so crazy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah it's confidential. Anything that your client tells you. So urgency, those kinds of things. You, you have latitude. You know, your job is to best present, <coughs> you know, the need, you know, to fulfill the needs of your client. So how should you answer yeah. that question? Yeah. Generally speaking, question. it's an irrelevant question. Irrelevant question. Yeah. On this, you're not going to need to know. It's not, it's, it's not important. Yeah. Submit your best offer. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. You can't just say they're in transition because they really are transition. They're moving from here. Let, somewhere let's else. just say, let's just say it was in my client's best interest to disclose that. I kind of need them to put that in writing to me, okay. to say, hey, I have to be out of here. By there's a sense of urgency that I need a fast close. Mm -hmm. I maybe I need to communicate that to the buyer. Every I mean, to the to the real yeah. estate public. So you really have to determine those things. But my my yeah. point is is don't automatically answer those questions. Remember, 
What does a buyer want? Buyer wants to pay the least amount of money. Right. Seller wants to pay the most. I, I told one seller, she goes, oh, you know, so I can't remember how the conversation came up. And I said, I love it. I said, when the buyer's pissed and the seller's pissed and they think they paid too much and they think they didn't get enough, you put it on the knife edge, you're like, I'm not going to pay a penny more. Well, man, that deal wouldn't have gone down if I didn't get that too. That was the number it was going to close at. Mm -hmm. Right? So do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it, it just comes back to um, remember buyers, are, you know, buyers agents aren't asking that question because they're trying to, you know, they're, they're fishing for information that's going to strengthen their yeah. knowledge to be able to get the best price for their client. And yeah. your job as the listing agent is to get the highest price mm -hmm. with the okay. least amount of hassle with somebody yeah. that you can trust. Yeah. Okay. Next document is wire fraud advisory. These are automatically attached, okay? I'm not gonna go into this, but I no longer have, I am no longer CC on title and escrow providing wire instructions. Mm -hmm. I put them in direct contact and I let title handle that because I don't wanna be part of that. I don't wanna get hacked by somebody because that's where they hack, they hack agents doing real estate deals. So anyway, that's automatically attached. So now I'm looking at this one. Okay, so so Adam gave me a contract to consider and I'm just gonna give you a few points. First of all, it was very, very clean offer and so this is like really nitpicking. And but I would say it's pretty much perfect. I would consider this perfect paper. Okay, so oh, I would look at an offer coming me. in, I would look at an offer coming in and going, I would immediately say, this is a professional agent, this this should be a very smooth transaction, because it ma the I tell my clients, the agents matter, yeah. right? So, the only things that I would <laughs> say is this one thing that's 25 days or less, mm -hmm. to me, is ambiguous, okay, and... Um, I would just be careful about it. not not that it's wrong or anything because I could understand from your offer that your clients wanted as fast of a close as they could reasonably get, right? So to accelerate the close was in your client's best interest, right? So um, to this point, to this point though, I just had a deal where uh, we were delayed. We were we had to extend the contract because. Um, we had uh, work that needed to be done in order to close it. Um, can you just turn my phone off? Is that your phone? I think it was. <laughs> okay, okay. No, no, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it's somebody else. Okay, so anyway, so we had um, a delayed escrow, so an addendum went out with uh, an accelerated close. Uh, my client wanted to close as soon as possible, right? As did the seller. Everybody wanted, everybody wanted this deal to close. Okay. The only person who didn't want it to close sooner was who? Who do you think? Me. I'm the broker. Because you did the seller hadn't stepped on a square. I hadn't received a critical document and critical things didn't occur. Right? So, I mean, I don't want to waste too much time on this, but... Um, Escrow was uh, more or less the, the choice of the listing agent. And, um, and like I said, we needed to do this work. This, the, it was a divorce, which the listing agent told me. Um, and it was crazy. I mean, I was, we were dealing with crazy people, like police had been called, altercations at the house, drama, drama, drama. Mm -hmm. Nothing on my side, but drama. And um, we're doing work, and it was my contractor doing the work to clear section one for a VA loan. And my contractor is literally on site. Police are being called, fights are ensuing, you know, verbal things, you know, just in your face kind of stuff. And he's like trying, trying to fix things with all this drama going on. So there was a, an addendum that the seller hadn't signed, the mister hadn't signed it. And the listing agent was, you know, I mean, just couldn't deliver documents in any, I mean, the, the disclosures I got were just, I started to correct them. And I was like, what am I doing? 
This is crazy. I, I said, I can't tell your seller how to complete their disclosures. First of all, I represent the buyer. I, I, like, I, I couldn't even believe that their brokerage let that out. Like, questions unanswered. I'm like, no, no, this has to be completed. So we're, we're just, just struggling to get through just the basics of a transfer disclosure statement. This. So we, we, I've got this addendum that's not signed and we're trying to close. Can I close this transaction without a fully executed addendum? No. That addendum covered when escrow would close, which said on or before such and such a date, based on the mutual agreement of the parties, right? Mm -hmm. So by the listing agent's been promising me the addendum, promising me the addendum, I'm not getting it. I finally give up on the listing agent. I, I couldn't even get an answer of when they were signing. Because quite frankly, I don't even know that the listing agent knew when her client was going to sign. So I call title and I said, when, when is the seller signing? So she, finally I get that answer. I said, there's an addendum that needs to be executed. I don't have it. I've been promised it. I keep getting promised it. I don't have it. I must have it. I cannot close this transaction without the addendum signed. And um, so uh, she goes, okay, it's in our package. Fine. I said, send it to me. So meanwhile, I write in all my contracts, it says that if escrow is delayed and if escrow falls on a Monday or a holiday, escrow is automatically extended one day. The reason why I write that into my contract is because I'm, if I'm, this is when I'm on the buy side, if you're, if you're on the seller side, you know, I'm, do you know what I'm saying? If, if I'm on the other side of the contract and you're the buyer's agent, then I don't care if this, if you have this issue. But if I'm representing the buyer, I have fiduciary duty to my buyer. I don't have fiduciary duty to your buyer. So I write that into my contract so that my buyer is never contractually obligated to fund on a Friday, close on a Monday. Right. Then they're paying interest over the weekend without possession. If that happened on a Thanksgiving, I would have to fund on a Wednesday, close on a Monday, and pay for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, right? So I protect my client from ever being in that position by automatically extending it. Now, if I can close it early and everybody's in agreement, then no problem. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't contractually put my client in that position. Right. So that's the reason why I don't, I, I may put 25, so this is what happened in this situation with that. Remember, I wrote the addendum on or before because we all wanted it to close early, but do I want to close it imperfect? No. Right, as the broker? No, you must step on the squares, and I was still chasing documents. So the buyer, the seller signs on Thursday. I'd been promised this document Wednesday. Friday, I still don't have it. We're just, we, we're, we literally finished the work maybe Thursday. I, I don't even know. I, I honestly, it was so crazy. I, and so now I'm, I'm just pissed, right? And I, I'm, I have been chasing this document. So I call the buyer's agent, the seller's agent, 4 p.m. on Friday, going, you know, where is this damn document? Give, give me a break, right? So I call her up and uh, she answers the phone. She goes, congratulations. I said, congratulations? She goes, yeah, we're on record. I said, what? She goes, yeah, we closed. This is days before this, on or before. I still don't have the document. And I'm literally like, um, thank you? Like, yay? Yay? Oh my God, I was just like, oh. So this, I, I guess I'm like, God, I'm like, okay, what do I need to do to idiot proof the transaction, right? So I call up, I, I was, I'm still thinking to file a complaint against escrow, right? Because what does that mean? I said, well, let me go run up to Yuba City and do a verification of, of property on a property my client already owns. Are you kidding me? I was fit to be tied. So I have to drop everything <coughs> because pursuant to my contract, could they close any earlier than Tuesday instead of this, that Friday? Mm -hmm. No. Oh, yeah. Right? I wrote in the contract. <laughs> if escrow falls on, right? 
Mm-hmm. We don't fund and record same day. Well, we don't do that, right? You can't do that. There are steps to be, until the steps are stepped on, right? Because is a document post-close, does it have, you yeah. miss something, you call me up and go, hey, and Catherine, I, I, I don't have my, you know, blah, blah, blah. Too bad for you. You will not get a document post-close from me. Mm-hmm. We've closed that transaction. You missed the mark. I'm sorry. So it's so luck important on that. to have everything five days prior to close investment. Right. In, right. In For broker up, review. Uploaded everything ready to go. Correct. So that escrow officer did not have the authority to close that transaction no. because back to ratification, without delivery to me, did that addendum exist? No, it doesn't matter. Yeah, doesn't matter whether title had it. Yeah. You don't freaking represent the client. Title is third party. You're the mm-hmm. neutral third party. Without delivery to me, that client's agent, that addendum didn't exist. It was not executed. Mm-hmm. You yeah. must have delivery. You can't have a document stuck in your back pocket and think that you're in contract. Mm-hmm. You're not. So, uh, believe me, I was fit to be tied. And... Um, I sent, she, so the, the um, escrow officer then sends me an email, well, says, it says, well, here, here's the document. Um, I'm sorry you didn't get the email that I sent previously with it. I said, you forward me that pr- previous email. Are you kidding? If you had sent that email, right? If you had sent that email, would you have sent me a new email or would you have forwarded me the original forward. email saying you didn't, you, if you, here, here's the email we sent on, you know, such yeah. and such a time. No, now you're lying. Mm-hmm. So, is that a problem? Yes. It was a big problem. So, do you think that there was drama and fallout because of that? Of course. Yeah. Do you think that the seller had gotten all their stuff out? No. I had a house full of crap. Mm. So now, can the seller now have access, unfettered access to the property yes. to get their stuff? Absolutely not. They do not own it. Oh, yeah. They're trespassing at this point. Yeah. I They're immediately no drove up, took the mm-hmm. keys, changed the locks. Buyer's agent, the seller's agent's pissed because now her client client can't get her stuff. And I said, yeah, I'm sorry, you you should have thought about that before Mm -hmm. you did X, Y, and Z. I said, but at this point, Mm -hmm. I said, my client owns the property and your client no longer has unfettered access to the property. We're more than happy to make arrangements, whatever. Did we end up having to clean up all that crap? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Guess what? They also took the washer machine, which was included in the sale. Ooh, eh? Do you think that this could have litigated post close? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Do you think I would have won? Hundred yes. percent. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. I'm going to win that. Mm-hmm. Do I want to be in that? No. No. So my point, my point, entire point of this whole thing is when you fill in that box of when you're going to close escrow, consider adding under additional terms something that gives you more control over that time period because when you put a 25 day is this vague this one 25 days or less do we know when escrow is going to close yeah we have no idea what day it's going to fall on because right not unless you look at the calendar and you get ratified that same day exactly so that's my next thing if i write a purchase agreement do i have any idea how many counters i'm going to go back and forth in no. The clock starts on ratification. You don't know when you submit an offer. You don't have the ratification date. Therefore, you can't know the close date. So that's when people put hard dates. That can be a problem too. Mm-hmm. If you put a hard date, and and it takes you a long time to go into contract, and that never gets readdressed. I've seen contracts where a contingency is a deadline is post the close date. Because <laughs> somebody came and hasn't done all those. Not. So is it a good practice to put that on every We are. Time, right? I do too. I do too. <laughs> Any questions about that? So would be the best to write that 30 days party. after execution? No, because, no. No, I, I'm not telling you what to write there. I'm telling you to be mindful of all the Other dominoes yeah. that could come into yeah, play. They, they so let's just days. say, let's just say that I'm in a competitive offer. And we know that the seller is in a rush to close. Mm-hmm. Do I want to write a 45-day close? No. Do no. I want to write a 30-day close? No. I want to write a 21-day close. I'm going to write what I need to write to, to achieve the objectives of my client. Right. 
all I'm saying is to the point of on or before, is that then subject to somebody, look at that escrow officer. Yeah, it's true. Right? And to her, her response to me is says, your addendum says on or before. And I'm like, the addendum that was not ratified, you can't deliver to me an addendum post-close and tell me that we agreed to that. That was never delivered to me. The, 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 and this is what I say to people when they start, you know, or a lender starts go, well, stay in your lane, it's, you know, my client, whatever. I'm like, no, I'm the architect of the entire transaction, right? You don't know every single thing. Does a lender know everything that's going on in a contract? No. Do we need the lender to know everything that's going on in a contract? No. Absolutely not, right? So no. should the lender be the tail wagging the dog? No. We're in charge, right? So so to me, you just want to be mindful. I don't know. You, it, it, I may have a, I did a transaction, multi-million dollar transaction. It took us 75, 90 days to close that deal. A lot of moving parts, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's dependent upon your, what's happening in your contract. All I'm saying is be careful of ambiguous language, mm -hmm. okay? Be careful if you're representing a buyer and you don't want a situation where you're, you're because you don't have all the facts, your timeline is now falling in the middle of a holiday and you're now back up against the wall, you're, you're scrambling, you're, you know, whatever it is. I'm just saying be mindful. My contracts all say if escrow falls on a holiday or a weekend or a Monday, I extend escrow automatically. So that I am never having to I go back to a seller. Is that verbiage on there? This I didn't write this contract. I represented the seller, oh, okay. but it's on the one that I wrote for Daisy. Okay. Okay. So I. Um, so it's a good practice to do it. Yeah. I'm I saying be everyone. mindful. Yeah. All I'm saying is be mindful. Again, I'm not criticizing this choice because I know from having spoken to Adam that his objective for his client. Mm -hmm. was to close it as fast as he could, yeah. mm -hmm. right? I'm saying, are all other agents perfect? Are all other escrow officers perfect? Could that potentially, because according to this, I could close in a day. Yeah. Well, not legally, because it's getting a loan, but you could close it on the eighth day, yeah. You could. I'm just saying, yeah. some somebody could accelerate that without your full buy-in. That's all I'm trying to say. I'm just saying, be mindful. And, and understand this issue of when is escrow going to close when you don't know how long you're, it's going to take you to ratify and when that clock is going to start. And if you're representing a buyer on a finance transaction, this issue of funding and recording and that your buyer could be paying for um, interest over a property they don't have possession. Do you think buyers like that? No. Typically they don't. You, okay. never, you never want to either do a fund and do a court on a fr uh, close by Friday or do it on a Monday, Tuesday. Okay, so now I want to go to paragraph 3B. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so let's look at paragraph 3D and let me see the one that of the agreement that I wrote. Where's the one I, uh, not the one that I wrote, the one that I provided. Okay, so this, uh, this is a funny story and I'm going to get into this on this one. Okay, the one that I gave is an example. Okay, so this, just so you know, the paragraphs may be different because this is um, the purchase agreement since November uh, 2014. Um, anybody looking at paragraph D, what can they tell me? So this, well, this isn't a good example because that was a cash offer, so not a good example. So let me, let me go to the one that Adam wrote. So Adam wrote that this is an adjustable rate loan not to exceed 4.5%, okay? How many of you fill in paragraph D1? Your wife is Angel. You're new enough that you haven't written a purchase no, agreement? I haven't. Okay. So I see paragraph D1 blank a lot. What does it mean when you write it blank? Well, that means no, no, no. You're a broker, so you don't get to answer that. What does it mean? That means they can be charged a lot higher interest rate for these things. When you fill in D and you put a loan of 252 and you leave this blank, you're obligated, you as the buyer, 
don't get to say, well, I, and you have a finance contingency, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's say you have a finance contingency, you put in the loan amount, you filled in, and you left D1 blank, okay? And then you come back, uh, Trump bombs uh, Iran, okay? And the interest rates interest shoot up, yeah. go through the roof, right? Um, and now the loan that that client was looking at, which was 4%, is now 8%. And the buyer says, well, I'm, I'm not going to close this deal at 8%. Does, is the buyer's earnest money deposit at risk? Yes. Yep. 100%. Yep. Because it says you're willing to s accept a loan at any Maybe. rate, at any terms that the market will bear. If anybody's willing to give you a loan, you're in breach of contract if you don't close that deal. So he put 4.5, but you did not fill in points and you did not fill in this is a this loan shall be a fixed rate not to exceed percentage okay or an adjustable rate w was it a fixed or adjustable fixed. so it would have been the first you would have needed to fill it in here so you put 4.5 here mm -hmm. which was the adjustable you wanted to put it there yep okay and i would bracket the points because what if they said, well, look, rates went up, but you can buy it down to 4.5. It's going to oh. cost you four points. Yeah, I'm yeah, still yeah. at risk. Yeah, okay. So you want to bracket it completely. Now, if rates today, which means you have to be in communication with your lender specific to that client, because does every client pay the same rate? No. Do you know what the rate was yesterday or a week ago or 10 days ago? Mm -hmm. Okay. So once you talk to your lender, say, hey, what, what rate are you quoting them? Well, I'm quoting them 3.875. Do I want to put 3.875 there? Yes. No. No. Put no. Four. Okay. four. Yeah. Pat it a little. Yeah. Because is the buyer going to not close the deal right. if it comes in at four? Because you maybe buy it now? Okay. So the other thing that you're going to find is you, so you have a zero point loan, right? And it's at 4%. You will not be able to put a zero on that page with the car yeah. win forms. So I put, if it's a zero point loan, my contract I'm paying you points, I'll put point zero zero one so that I have a placeholder there that protects my client. Now if rates shoot up, it, my clients my clients under no obligation to close the loan. Sorry, right. where am I putting the point zero zero one? Go ahead and highlight. Right there. Okay. Buyer shall pay points <coughs> not to exceed. Okay, thank right. you so much. Okay. If it's an FHA loan, do I use D1? Yes. Nope. No. Well, no, I'm, I, I'm on FHA is three. Uh, if I have an FHA loan, so if this loan will be conventional financing, I have to check the box FHA, VA, seller, if those apply. So the, when you leave it unchecked, it's conventional. Yeah. That's all. Okay? And if it's an FHA loan, then you need to include the FHA addendum. Okay, so now we're <coughs> on page two, the purchase agreement. This is the one that Adam wrote. Now, if anybody wants to uh, stump me, they're welcome to, okay? But... Uh, I fill out, so one of the documents I always include with an offer is a market conditions advisory, okay? Um, I always include that document with an offer, why? Because the market conditions advisory says, hey, Mr. Buyer, Ms. Buyer, markets go up, markets go down. Who's, whose obligation is it to set the offer price? The buyers is it yours no you're gonna pay their mortgage no so I need to put my buyer on notice that they need to take ownership of what they write markets go up markets go down and I remind them hey offers aren't necessarily kept confidential here's some things to think about so market conditions <coughs> advisory. so on five and then in advisories I'm gonna check that box other okay and I'm going to put the two things I'm going to put there because it only fits in the way I'm going to write it now. And you're going to see it on the one I wrote for Daisy. It says market condition and wire fraud advisories. 
because the wire fraud advisory is now attached to the purchase contract, but it is not referenced, to my knowledge, in the purchase contract. Yeah, we have the commission and wire fraud? Okay. Yeah, so I write in, I check the box other, and I will write market conditions, ampersand, the symbol for and, wire fraud advisories, because there's a market conditions advisory and a wire fraud advisory, but now it's plural. So I'm going to add that. And in your case, you added an SBSA to your contract, so that box should have been checked because it was part of the contract. Now, I'm going to say, if I'm the listing agent, do you think I want to see the SBSA with the offer? Yes or no? Probably, yeah. I think so. No. no. Okay. I don't want to you're, see add, you're already adding, if I have eight offers, that's now 160 pages I have to process okay. if everybody did that. Okay. If I have a disclosure package already, do I already have an SBSA yes. executed by the seller? Do I want that paper duplicated? No. So I'm not going to do it in general. Now, it, there may be a time that you really want it. You, you're like, you know what, this client, they're like super... Well, just their mindset, you're like, let me give them an SBSA right now. And maybe I might give a buyer under buyer broker agreement. I might give them an SBSA with their buyer broker agreement. But I'm typically not going to include one with an offer. The one I do is a market conditions advisory because I feel like a market conditions advisory really speaks to the moment at hand. You're determining your offer price. Just like when I'm listing a property, I'm going to do a market conditions advisory with the seller at time of listing because you're determining the list price, right? So there's that. Um, the next one, again, is, is personal um, allocation of costs and inspections and reports. So on this one, um, Adam, the natural hazards dis disclosure is required. It's a statutory disclosure. So uh, it's good that we, you know, the sellers really have that obligation, but they don't have to pay for it, but they typically do. So it's almost always check seller. Um, you checked environment. I would always check other and add tax because to me, one of the things that matters to my buyer is that supplemental tax. I want it broken down, no surprises. The other thing you put was pay, prepared by seller's choice. Now, I'm not being paid to say this, but I always specify property ID. And the reason why I specify property ID, I used to always specify disclosure source because their maps are really pretty and I like color, right? But is that what's important in the NHD, is that my map is pretty? No. No. What matters to me is liability. So only property ID has indemn indemnifies the brokers. So if they screw it up, they're indemnifying the brokers involved. So it, to me, it's a better protection. If you want, I can introduce you guys to the rep for property ID, and yeah. she can explain to you herself why their product is, to me, is superior in the business. So I do my research, and I say, who's the best? Do I want just any pest contractor doing my inspections? No. no. Right? I, I want the, the company that I feel, if, if yes, they're not all the same, so I'm going to look at them and determine who I think is the best. So once I did the research, that's what I did, but I always include that. The next thing I always include, and Kenny and I had a direct conversation about that, and again, this is one of those areas that puts me in a lot of friction with other agents when they get down into it, okay, because it's a pain in the ass. Yes. Okay, so it used to be that the clue report was always included with the NHD, and it was at no cost. It, you just checked a box, and the clue report was in it. And by the way, you probably don't know what a clue report is. Um, if you're new, a clue report stands for Comprehensive Loss Underwriting Exchange. When there's a, an insurance claim, it goes into a central database, and Farmers puts in there, and Allstate, Liberty Everybody. Mutual, and they all put that data in there, okay? So... To this point, so we know that a seller has to disclose whether there's been an insurance claim against the property for five years, the last mm -hmm. five years, right? We know that they're going to have to disclose that, right? Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question. Do, do sellers always get their disclosures right? No. No. Right? Mm -hmm. Could a 
an honest dis seller fail to disclose an insurance claim? Yes. Under what yes. conditions would they might not disclose that? Forget it. They forgot. Yeah. They filed the claim, but then canceled it. Yeah. They filed the claim that wasn't approved, so the insurance didn't pay out, so they don't think it needs to be disclosed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The other thing that people don't understand about the Clue Report, I, if I live in a golf course community, and I'm concerned about golf balls hitting my yeah. property, right? And I'm buying property at 101 Golf Court Lane, um, and I request a clue report, or the, I say to the seller, hey, have you ever had an insurance claim? No, never have. But his neighbor on both sides have had multiple claims for golf balls. Am I going to be concerned that maybe my house is going to, I just got lucky, and that my buyer's property is going to be hit by a golf ball? Yeah. So do you think that the insurance company, when they go to look at insurability, that they consider only 101 golf course lane? No. Or do they look at the community surrounding? Community if you're living in a high crime neighborhood and you've never been robbed, but all the neighbors on your block have been robbed, do you think the insurance companies know that? Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. Hell yes. Mm -hmm. To me, with the fires in California and everything that's been going on, our so, next wave of litigation will be over insurance fire insurance just all. insurance yep. okay so and this <laughs> is another thing I'm going to get to so I always include when I'm representing a buyer I always include a clue report because let's just say this back to the NHD can a, a seller's obligated to provide a natural hazards disclosure report can the seller complete that document on wind forms Yes. yes. Absolutely. Would you trust your seller to do that? <coughs> no. Hell no. Do you want your seller to be providing HOA docs? No. <laughs> right? The minutes and meet all their statutory disclosures. <coughs> Why put on a seller something that you can independently verify from a third party source? Right. If you're on the listing side, does this benefit your seller to provide a clue report? Yes. Right? Yeah. It totally benefits your seller. Why? Just because what's the number one cause of litigation in real estate? Non-disclosure. Failure to disclose. Is it buyers failing to disclose mostly? It's sellers. Oh, it's sellers, yeah. right? Are they always doing it intentionally? No. Mm -hmm. Are they all bad? No. no. Let's just take that one thing off of their plate. Mm -hmm. And as a buyer's agent, why would you not want that information? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you want to be sure that you got the right information? Your job as the buyer, I, I tell my buyers, I said, when I'm out of that transaction, let me tell you, you and me, we're going to know more about that property than everybody else. We're going to be the most informed on that property because isn't that what you want your buyers to have, to be the most informed on what they're purchasing? Absolutely. As a, as a listing agent, do you ever want to get in the way of a buyer's due diligence? Right? Okay. So I always check the box, seller shall pay for the following report. Clue report prepared by LexisNexis, it's capital L-E-X-I-S, capital N-E-X-I-S, no space, at no cost to the seller. Because they're free. Now, in the case of your client um, on Utah, I, I think something went awry with that report in that they provided information pursuant to his other properties where it needed to be not related to him but to the property so something went so there was a hiccup in that process I, I don't know where it went but it it shouldn't have necessarily pulled his other properties exactly. it should have just been related to the Too subject bad. property exactly. so just keep in mind that this this is something if you're on the buy side just like I wouldn't want my, my NA, are there some really unknown NHD providers? I mean, the way you've written it, the seller could have provided you the NHD and he would have met his statutory disclosure requirement. Would you, would you trust it if it came from the seller, your NHD? His own? You said, See, oh, seller's, choice. seller's choice. Oh yeah, but yeah. Seller could say, I'll, I'll fill that out. I know, I know all of that. The seller could have, it is, it is not against the law for the seller to complete an NHD. And it's online. Would you would you want that? 
No, no. No. Do you want it from the <laughs> Joe Blow and HD company that started last uh, week? You may yes. want to write, you idea. could I'm say, disclosure so JCP, yes. property yes. ID, yes. whoever yes. you would accept. Yes. But again, yes. you're leaving it to the yes. seller. Yes. What if he's one of these crazy, you know, anti-establishment, blah, blah, blah. I'm not paying $99. I didn't know that. I've had sellers like that. I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen. We're going to provide it by this company, you know, non-negotiable. You're not filling out your NHD. Right? There's just a point where, I mean, so you kind of have to look at that from the yeah. ridiculous standpoint. Okay. Yeah. So, so what makes you scary? What makes me scary? <laughs> no, no, it's so not. You're like, look at it this way. Uh, it's like, good with these protections. At the end of the day, yeah. your job is fiduciary. Yeah. Uh, is it a little fiduciary or is it fiduciary? Fiduciary. With a capital F, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. right. This is so good. I mean, oh my gosh. Okay, so now the next, on um, this is on yours, Adam. So, the seller, now this is very common. How common is it for listing agents to direct where title and escrow is going to be? Mm -hmm. Page three, go on page three. I'm on page three. How common is it for the listing agent to tell you where to put title and escrow? Mm -hmm. They put the instructions on there. But Free escrow, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Escrow, that, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where they have registered. Uh-huh. Okay. Where the house is already Do you think in. that's a problem? Yeah. That yeah. It's an absolute problem. It's a RESPA violation. Ooh. Seller pay, seller direct, seller pay. That's right. So the but minute the buyer is paying, which is in California, buyers typically pay title and escrow. Buyer pay, buyer direct. So if you're being told where you're being go. bullied oh, into putting <laughs> title and escrow, is, is escrow the neutral third party? Mm. Oh, by law, does that mean in practice? Does that mean in practice? No. Yeah, it is. Okay, well, I, I, I'm sorry that I've had as many transactions that I've had that I can tell, the horror stories I can tell. But I closed a transaction in Richmond. I represented the buyer. Seller, the, my buyers lived in San Francisco, were buying in Richmond. The listing agent was a San Francisco agent, and she put she wanted title and escrow yes, in yes, San Francisco, yes. not in Richmond. Is that a hill I'm going to die on? No. No. It's if it's going to blow the deal and my client wants that property, I'm going to be sure or we'd be happy to work with your title and escrow company of choice. Is it right? No. No, no it's wrong, right? But is it a hill I'm going to die on? No. No, not typically. So I am going to put title and escrow there, if that's going to make the difference of whether we're going to get a deal put together. Yeah. So in that case, title and escrow went to San Francisco, and again, it, that's convenient for my sellers. Is it convenient for me as the broker? No. Mm -hmm. hell, hell no. But it was convenient to them, well, who do I care about? It's not about my schedule and my difficulty, mm -hmm. but when it came to the signing, I couldn't necessarily, the signing was at 5 p.m. on a Friday. No. I'm going to be putting that kind of traffic. I don't know in a helicopter, right? So how am I supposed to, in my schedule, make it to a signing in San Francisco out in the ocean, out in the avenues yeah. at 5 p.m.? So nobody expected me to be at that signing. But I made it to that signing. So I'm sitting in the escrow officer. I'm sitting at a conference table. I'm sitting here. I've already reviewed the closing documents, right? Mm -hmm. I, I've files ready to close. And... Um, listing agent was really difficult. I mean, I, I, I hate to say this, but I could take a lot of people's license if I wanted to. I don't. It's cooperative business. I'm not, that, that's why I'm here. I'm here because I'd rather raise the, the quality right. of the, the uh, organization. But this was an agent who got in the way numerous times of the buyer's rights and due diligence. She was one of the worst agents I've ever worked with. But are you ready for this? Her broker is past president of the San Francisco Association of Realtors. How far do you think a ethics complaint against that agent was going to go? Mm -hmm. Right? So I'm just trying to get through it, right? right. Mm -hmm. So I show up at the signing. I'm sitting at a conference table. It's one of these round tables about, you know, the size of this times two. And my client's sitting there. My two clients are sitting there. The escrow, office, I mean, the escrow officer is sitting there, and they're signing papers going this far away from me, Right? And I'm watching paper go across the desk, and I see a piece of paper go across the desk, and they put the piece of paper in front of my client. Oh, okay, here, sign here. And my clients are like pen out, right? 
I said, what's that? And they passed the paper over to me. It was an addendum. Oh, it was, I, you guys are already afraid of me. I'm popping a vein, right? <laughs> I'm like, what? And I don't want to go into this addendum, but, but again, this is an agent who thinks she's an attorney, and she's writing all this ridiculously indemnifying language over something. It was like over a GFCI that had tripped. So anyway, this addendum is a train wreck. It is so, so anti-real estate. I'm like, yeah, hell to the no. My client's not signing that. We didn't agree. I've never seen this addendum. Mm -hmm. So did that violate my agency? Oh, yes. 100%. You've now violated my agency (laughs) because that means that the seller's Mm -hmm. agent wrote an addendum and gave it directly to my client by the house yeah had I not been at that signing do you think that addendum would have been signed yes yeah. hell yes yeah. now are you ready for how it got answered mm. this is when I say to you be careful about letting sellers choose your escrow office That's right. okay so I'm like yeah sorry we don't agree to that that's all I said you know I'm sorry yeah you can toss that baby and um, I said and I said to him, I said, what do you think would happen when that addendum went to the bank? We were at the closing table. Mm. We're, we're ready to fund. Mm. And this was a condition issue. The, the, the listing agent and the seller were making a mountain out of a molehill. It was, it was a non-issue, but they had, a, you know, their panties in a bunch, however you want to say it. So I said to the escrow officer, I said, what do you think would have happened when you gave that addendum to the bank, to the lender. Are you ready for the answer? Uh, oh. So if I hadn't popped a vein already, they go, well, we weren't gonna give it to the lender. Oh, what? I was like, oh, okay, let me make sure I got that straight. So you're gonna violate my agency oh. and you're gonna commit bank fraud. Oh my God. Oh, <laughs> did I get what? that right? Oh, wow. yeah. Did I get oh, that right? Do you crazy. think? Holy moly. Do you think that that's an ethical violation <laughs> oh, yeah. of all parties? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> I mean, do you think the DRE? I mean, the SFAR may might not take that as an issue, but I can tell you the DRE won't won't take. Won't this take is like why that. it's so important to be at every signing. Yes. That's why. Yes. I, that's why I go to signs. Wow. I make sure what they're signing right. is what is there already. What I reviewed already. Because sometimes they will sneak it and then them in. Yeah. I've just, had it happen numerous you know, times. Oh, by the way. Oh, the, the I can't even agent, tell you. I can't even tell you. The listing agent wants your so many the buyers to, to sign and his And you know why like, it happens? It's because to I am tough. Yeah. Yeah, they I'm knew tough. that I would have never get, yeah. agreed to that. So these agents who were like, oh, you know, we're just going to bypass her. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. That's Very not how this works. <laughs> I've had it happen. It was, I walked into another, I have a hilarious client. I've done multiple transactions with him. And something similar happened. We were doing a big deal in Sacramento. And um, I said to my client, the, the escrow officer was there. I said, oh my God. I said, Nathan, I said, I could write a book on your transaction alone, Real Estate 101. And my client goes, most boring book ever. <laughs> I just thought it was hilarious. And the escrow officer was like, I'd read it. And I said, that's problem. I said, You'd read it, but not the people who would need to read it, which is great, right? But it was pretty funny. All right, so now um, I'll I'll try to wrap up. So escrow and title, so we talked about that, other costs. Um, On this home warranty. Real quick before I go there. Yeah. You can write, if if the seller or the listing agent say, we're picking escrow because so-and-so for whatever reason. Yeah. You know you could have to say, so we'll sell it and pay for title and escrow. That's fine. That's fine. You know what I mean? So as a as a listing agent, I'm getting to the place where I'm I'm not as readily opening pre escrows if I know that there's not a, a, a really title issue yeah. because I like to be able to say to a buyer's agent, oh by the way, I'm not going to force you to use my. Title. They're like, what? Really? You're like the nicest person ever. We're paying for it. They know. Buyer's agents know, yeah. right? <laughs> okay. So on um, D nine and ten. So you put a First American Home Warranty on this particular property, you checked the box for air conditioner, and you checked upgraded. But down here, this is, there's a spa included. So you might want to have checked the box for pool spa. 
that spot ran into trouble and stuff on there. I had to get her an addendum that wasn't that was that wasn't the spot wasn't included. Yeah, because the lender wouldn't take it to this. Well, okay. Gen- just this. generally speaking, yeah. if there's a pool or a spa or whatever, there's oh, yeah. extra yeah. things. Yeah. So on my contracts, again, I I used to always use BPG. This is just me personally, so I'm just giving you my own personal opinion. Uh, I used to use a buyer's protection group, and then they got bought out by Fidelity, and I wasn't happy with their performance anymore. And I then did my research, and I use exclusively American Home Shield. Um, I have a rep with American Home Shield. Everybody's on speed as soon as possible, because what if something comes up and I need a further inspection? Yeah. Okay? I need time. I may even need the time to negotiate. Yeah, you right, because, because let's say I wait, uh, let's just say something came up on inspection, and I'm going to negotiate, right? And let's say I wait until day 17 to hand the seller a request for repairs. What can the seller do? And issue a notice to perform. And I'm out of time. Yes. Yeah. Right? But if I'm, if I'm really ahead of that, then I have time to further inspect, I have time to negotiate, I don't want to be waiting at the last minute. So if a buyer, if a seller is delivering me disclosures late, if I get a bunch of disclosures, is that going to impact, and I hand them to my, my buyer, is that going to impact their elections? Oh yeah. What they see on the disclosure will then determine what they what want they to want investigate to further, yeah. right? So I want to make sure that I have enough time prior to my having to remove my contingency, I'm representing a, a, do I care as much if I'm on the listing side? No. Not as much. Not really my problem. I represent the seller. I want it tight. Do I want to get in the way of a buyer's due diligence? Not really. Not really, right? I'm going to do everything I can to bulletproof the transaction, no matter which side I'm on, okay? I'm not in it to have deals cl- not closed. I'm a closer, right? I'm there to close it. But that being said, the only thing I might have done, because you said that they had their disclosures already prepared, is I might have made this three and eight if I wanted to keep this timeline, just to give myself more than three days. Three days, I, I don't know about you, but my a lot of my inspectors book out a week in advance. I can't get them to a property. They're busy right away. And Catherine, I'm so sorry I have kids to pick up. It was wonderful meeting you. It was a pleasure meeting you, and Angel. Sure. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. The other thing is, when do you guys order insurance for a property when you're representing a buyer? When does that need to be done? I do it way before I remove my inspection contingency. Okay. How about you guys? When do you get the buyer? When, when do you have that done? Who does it? Who instructs the buyer to get insurance? Well, you should it. Agent will tell them that when the loan is approved, usually that's the time that. Okay. A lot of people don't understand this. Evidence of insurability is a contingency. You need to remove it at the same time that you remove your inspection contingency. Mm-hmm. So that insurance should already be handled by whatever the date is on that. Before you give up your loan contingency. Before you give up your. It's inspection. part of your contingencies. It says it right there on the form, evidence of insurability. It's part of your, the buyer's investigation of, um, yeah. Yeah, so don't, anyway. Yeah, don't wait for the last minute. So I'm gonna just briefly discuss, just to put it in perspective, what I've been talking about. So the one, the contract I gave you, which I don't even know what I'm looking at, where I'm looking at it, because I, somehow I think I've got just your contract. So the one that I provided, I think it's illustrative, okay? That was a, I had an agent working for me and she went and listed this property in Oakland and, and then I reviewed the listing as the broker. I, I took a look at this and I said, oh, oh, time out, time out. I said, you are in over your head. You, you don't have the skill set to handle this transaction as the listing agent. I just could see it, right? I'm very good at seeing the chessboard. I looked at that and I said, wow. I said, um, you're going to have to co-list this with me. We're going to be co- you know, 50-50 on this um, because you're going to need my skill level to manage this transaction. And she agreed. She knew it. So, so we said, okay, fine. 
So we put the property on the market. I provided to the real estate community an instruction to how to submit on this specific property. And it was detailed, it was bullet pointed. It had, you know, include this, include that, make sure you look at that, da 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 da. This is what we want, this is that. Everything was detailed out, okay? I had six offers on the property, so it was competitive. We threw out the bottom three, okay? Talking about the one that you had. We threw out the bottom three and we went to counter the top three, okay? So these are the best three in Oakland. This is only a few years ago. In Oakland, and um, and then and I went with my agent and presented the offers and worked with the seller on drafting the counter offers. Now, as you know, and I know you're super new, but as you know, um, what document would I use to counter the, the buyers in this case? Multiple A seller multiple counter, right? right? How many pages is a seller multiple counter? It's a one page document, right? Okay, so if I'm countering three buyers, how much paperwork should I typically need to craft to deal with these offers? Three. So I have countered the three best offers, threw away the three worst offers, and I only corrected their technical mistakes. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that I had provided an offer submission guideline. How many pages do you think I had to craft just to correct the technical mistakes of three of the best offers? I would say six. Six? Ten? Ten? I'll be six. About t uh, 28 to 30, yeah, I can't recall. 28 to 30, only correcting technical mistakes. Like literally, I can't, uh, I can't put my client in contract because of the technical mistakes of this contract. Okay? So we correct all the technical mistakes, right? We go into contract, the first buyer we went into contract, the agent lived on the street. We pre-disclosed those serious um, soil issues, foundation issues, slide issues in the area, whatever. So this, we had geotechnical reports, we had all kinds of information uh, go into contract, and the person we ended up in contract with initially um, was an agent that lived on the street. <laughs> so he should know, right? <laughs> so that deal fell apart before we got out of the gate. Even though he wrote a non-contingent offer, he never put earnest money in title. Now, here's a question to you. Does he have the right to cancel? For okay, so we, we ratified the agreement, non-contingent, and the, 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 the buyer backed out. They never put the earnest money into, into title, and they sent cancellation paperwork. Remember, I represented the seller. What do you think the remedy would be in such a situation? What would you do? How would you handle that? There's no contingency. You have the no contingency. But they never put the EMD into title. And then they canceled. They just didn't perform. They never put the EMD in title. Do we have a contract? Yes. Yes. Yeah, do have yes. People say, oh, but there was no EMD. That is, that is there was no happen. consideration. No. The minute you put it on the contract. It's considered. That's consideration. Yes. The fact that you never delivered it to the title doesn't d absolve you. Right. So they, we'd also had a liquidated damage clause. Do you guys know what that yes. means? Yes. Yeah. yeah, a little bit? Liquidated damage clause in California on single family is limited to what? 3%. 3%. So when you put more than 3% into, uh, uh, into escrow, Oh, you put more than three percent as your as your earnest money deposit. What do you think a top producer thinks? They think that you don't have, you don't know the contract because why would you put more, more than three percent? Well, it strengthens my offer. For yeah. what purpose? It doesn't benefit my seller. Yeah. Because we're now limited to three percent, right? So this had a three percent earnest money deposit. For whose benefit is the liquidated damage clause? Oh, okay. 
Okay. Not necessarily. Yeah. Could be for the buyer too. It really depends whether the market's going up or the market's going down. Mm. Right? Because winners and losers. So if if the if there's a liquidated damage clause, what we're saying is look, we're not gonna litigate over damages. We're not gonna fight over whether it's three thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand. We're gonna determine up front what the damages are. So we don't fight about that number. Right. So it's a three percent. So but it's limited to what's in title. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question. Do you get the benefit of the liquidated, signed liquidated damage clause if you never put the money in title? Yes. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. You breached the contract. You ultimately nullified the liquidated damage clause. I'm not trying to be an attorney here. But in that case, I could argue the damages are whatever the damages are, right? If the market changes and my client's damaged 100,000, how do you get the benefit of the liquidated damage clause when your first act was to not put the EMD into title, right? So that being said, we had five other offers. We went into contract right away with buyer number two. Okay, so remember, full counter, correct all the technical mistakes, yeah. non-contingent offer, fully disclosed. Long story short, that second buyer, buyer number two, was, was a broker represented by one of his own agents in his office, and we litigated that matter and he wrote a check. So that broker ended up in a lawsuit for failing to perform, right. okay? And when I showed up, and did I really have a choice in the matter? No, my client was damaged. Yeah. So my client being damaged, her remedy was to take the seller, I mean the buyer, through arbitration, mediation. So we go to mediation, and this comes back to perfect paper, right? We go to mediation, and I was, fit, I was pretty upset, you know? Uh, we did end up closing the deal in uh, with buyer number three. Um, but my client did suffer a loss as a result of that uh, buyer one's behavior, buyer two, and I, I te was tempted and I probably should have litigated against the first buyer. But we did litigate because of the egregious actions of the buyer number two and his attitude. I mean, partially his attitude got him into the hot water of having zero accountability um, for this. He also did not put the full EMD in, he put a partial EMD in, and to my point, he did that intentionally to limit his exposure. Right. So, um, but we were then limited to to what was in title unless we wanted to litigate that so, further. So, yeah. so anyway, the bottom line is this, is we showed up to mediation, and I showed up with my contract, he had no file. He was writing notes on the back of a napkin. It was a full-on loss. Oh my God. Full loss. I'm like, write a check. And you are lucky to keep your license. You, you, you're, you're lucky because wow. your license should be taken over these actions. Because you're putting the public at risk. The public has to rely on everybody's duty of good faith and fair dealing, number mm -hmm. one. So, and they need to rely on reasonable skill and the performance of yeah, the duties. That's true. So. Yeah, because like, here's the thing. What if it's a... I'm gonna look at this. $300,000 home, right? And you put a $1,000 deposit. How much liquidity and damage is that? Well, if you only put a $1,000 in, based on the argument on here. Three percent up. Well, no, she's saying, well, but but if you did have the money into escrow, the, the if you only put $1,000 in, you're, you're your liquidity damage would be capped at a thousand. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to make two last comments on just overall transactions, okay? So one of the other things that I get into, which happened with that San Francisco agent, was this issue of indemnifying sellers and buyers doing work on a property or just, you know, this fighting that happens when a, a buyer is trying <coughs> to... Uh, manage any kind of repair okay so the other thing is is unless you mutually agree so if i say hey i want the seller to do x work okay 
in a request for repair and the seller agrees, can I control who does the work? Not really. Seller can pick anybody they want. Right. Is the seller care about doing the best quality work necessarily? No. No, they're not as motivated, right? So <laughs> they're trying to get in and out for the least amount of cost and get on with their lives, and I understand that. We, we need to understand that when we're on the buy side. So you should care when you're representing a buyer how that work is going to get done. Now, if it requires a permit, they need to do it with permitted licensed contractors. But, but the point being is some things they could do themselves. They, you know, you don't know, right? You need to also be able to verify that work. But, but the contract has already dealt with that. You have to remember that when you start writing lengthy indemnifying language or some uh, some complicated addendum for some reason, you are running the risk that you're practicing law. Right. We are not lawyers. Our job is to check the boxes fill in the blanks, right? Um, when you start to go past that, you need to kind of check yourself whether or not, A, you're overstepping. Um, and Talk to you soon about that. Um, boot camp. So boot we're camp. talking about Wednesdays. Okay. At I lunch. just got to go so so off so okay. Okay. earlier. Everybody here at AHS wants to thank Ann Catherine. Oh, thanks. Anissa has uh, been in real estate for quite a while, and how do you feel about what she did, Anissa? It was great. Anybody that hasn't uh, taken her class or if she's going to be in your area, definitely consider going, and she's going to be doing a boot camp, uh, consider it, definitely. It's, it was great. Awesome. <laughs> she she even went through my file and found a bunch of stuff, but it's a learning experience. I'm glad she did it. No, thank that, you again. that was perfect paper. I was nitpicking. Well, we went over a lot of other stuff. Well, thank you. Thank you.